episode 211 of the Outdoor Biz Podcast with outdoor pack maker extraordinaire Dana Gleason, brought to you by Revenue River. Revenue River is a Colorado-based digital technology and marketing agency helping companies in the outdoor industry execute their e-commerce and online efforts. As certified big commerce and Shopify partners and a Diamond HubSpot partner, they are well-equipped with the technical experience and expertise to solve any business problem. Whether you need help with website design, system integrations, online store management, or growth marketing, they will help you achieve your goals. Revenue River clientele also includes Sterling Rope, Deuter USA, Alps Outdoors, and the Outdoor Biz Podcast. When you're ready to compete and win online, contact the Revenue River team at revenueriver.co slash outdoorbiz. I believe achieving success in the outdoor biz is dependent upon embracing the outdoor lifestyle and learning from outdoor leaders that came before you. If you agree, then listen up for tips, advice, and hacks about growing or starting your career in the outdoor biz. My name is Rick Says. Welcome to the Outdoor Biz Podcast. So I've been hearing from retailers, brands, outfitters, and others that one of the challenges they face these days is engaging with new and existing customers. You post on all the socials, public, publish articles, blogs, videos in order to grab attention, and the response is, eh, maybe not, let's just say not what you hoped. Today, a better option is a podcast, and you might think you don't have the time or the budget or the talent to produce one, but I think you do, and I'll show you how. A podcast will give you broader reach to an unlimited amount of customers and a clear opportunity to meaningfully impact a huge number of people. So if you're curious about podcasting, visit podcastersworkshop.com slash brainstorm, and let's jump on a call and talk about it. So I'm excited to be talking with Dana Gleason today. Dana's been making packs for over 40 years in the outdoor industry, some of the best packs I've ever carried, and it's always fun to catch up with him at trade shows and now on the podcast. Welcome to the show, Dana. Howdy, Rick. How you doing today? Ah, having a good one. Yeah. It's just another uh, effing day in paradise. <laughs> another effing day in spring. Yep. Yep. I can relate to that. So uh, let's get started with how you got introduced to the outdoors. Was that as a kid or how'd that come about? I was definitely as a kid. And uh, I have to uh, thank my parents. Oh. And, you know, it wasn't purely backpacking, but uh, I was raised just outside of Boston. And, uh, my parents who had their own independent business doing a flower shop, florists, oh, wow. um, just plain always made time in the summer, which actually as florists is easy to do. It's a slow time of the year. And we would go up to New Hampshire to Dolly Cop campground or, mm you know, up past the notch, uh, all sorts of places. Cool. And while it was, uh, for the most part, dragging a tent camper that we would then fold open, <laughs> um, we'd be up there a couple of weeks at a time and doing all sorts of day trips, climbing Mount Washington or Mount Jefferson. Wow. And, uh, it just, it just was normal. Yeah. Very fun. And, uh, then at age 12, at age 12, they then badly warped me when we did a six-week trip across the country out to the Rockies and uh, then up through Yellowstone. And uh, That's magnificent country. Oh, yeah, it sure is. And uh, we got to go out and uh, with a cousin of mine do some stupid things in the Tetons and <laughs> Yeah, kind of. The die was cast. That's awesome. That's awesome. Did you do any other, like when you graduated at high school, did you go on a big trip or as you? Um, you know, when I graduated from high school, I uh, jumped right into college. Mm. And uh, that was sort of pretty much expected from people from my town. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, no objections to it. But as much it was driven by. I don't want to get drafted and go to Vietnam. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, one year of that, the deferments worked and the next year they decided that it wasn't fair and everybody should have a shot at, uh, carrying a gun for uncle Sam involuntarily. Right. And, uh, once I was, you know, at the, uh, at the hands of chance, um, I did a big trip after my, uh, freshman year of college, uh, mm. out to, well, the Tetons. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, basically 
that warped me <laughs> from the standard view of you go to college, you get your degree, you get a job. Um, I badly needed uh, some more different bits of gear. I wanted to stay connected to the outdoors and mm. I had an opportunity to start working at a shop. Oh, okay. now, admittedly, it was a shop in the Chicago area, which is not exactly what one would think of as, Hey, I'm in the mountains. <laughs> yeah, right. But basically people in Chicago, they badly need a trip when the opportunity comes up. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, helping out uh, at a shop there the first year or two um, got me into what we grandly call show business. <laughs> the outdoor biz. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, and you've been designing and building packs for over 40 years. What inspired your first design, your first creation? How'd that come about? Uh, pain and frustration. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. Um, uh, I, I was using the gear of the time, and uh, there were some improvements that were clearly needed. Um, I had graduated from using Kelty Pack frames, uh, trying to use it for all things, including ski touring, mm -hmm. climbing, and other stuff. And while they're a hell of a pack on the trail, yeah, they are a hideous torture machine <laughs> when it comes to actually trying to do approaches or climb or ski. Right. And, uh, you know, at the time there wasn't a hell of an, a lot. I mean, I started up pre low brothers. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. we had a few deeply weird packs from, uh, people like Jerry Cunningham and the like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I ran across a pack that a gentleman named Don Jensen mm -hmm. had, uh, kind of, uh, designed. Uh, over in England, he had a home sewing machine and, you know, it was kind of a cult item. It was really weird. It was a pack that derived its structure from simply being stuffed full. Okay. And uh, this became uh, you know, something that came from a company that came to be known as uh, Rivendell. Mm -hmm. And I went through a couple of them. And in principle, they were great. And the thought was astonishing. Mm -hmm. All kudos to Don Jensen. Unfortunately, he believed in, you know, all sorts of cool things like don't own a car, ride a bike, <laughs> et cetera. And uh, he got uh, run down by a car riding a bike in England. Oh, man, that's too bad. I didn't know oh, yeah. That. I didn't life. know that. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's rough. Yeah. But he <laughs> started that whole thing. And this gave us some packs that didn't have a whole lot of extra weight, mm -hmm. um, could work well as long as you packed them well. Mm -hmm. The stuff he came up with uh, had, you know, essentially a, a zipper main closure as well as a sleeping bag compartment mm -hmm. and uh, worked really well so long as you had them stuffed with the right amount of stuff. Right. And, and packed if, appropriately, uh, right? Had the right stuff yeah, in the right it wasn't place. Full, yeah. It just sagged. Yeah. And if it was really full, mm, even in spite of the tailoring that turned it into two vertical tubes and one horizontal tube, more or less laid out like the uh, like your lumbar region and mm -hmm. the muscle masses on either side of your back. Um, you know, I mean, you could make it work pretty <laughs> darned good. Yeah, yeah. Or you could have it work as freaking bad as anything else may be worse. <laughs> right. Um, and so I started applying some further thought to that. And this was after I'd been doing a couple of years of mods and custom work and had a decent uh, heavy duty machine. Mm -hmm. uh, during a time when I was shifting from managing an outdoor store to becoming a sales rep. Okay. Which was utterly important because you can get great ideas. Yeah, you great feedback, right. Turn out a cool thing. But if you have no way to get it to the people, yeah. then it's just going to be, you know, some cool object with maybe some historical pictures <laughs> and you worked in a garage. Right. Well, and as I a sales guy, a as a sales guy, you got to get good feedback too. 
Direct well, there feedback. is that. Yeah. And the other part is, is you are actually, if you're a decent sales guy, you're willing to listen to people. Right. Just mm-hmm. talk, talk, talk. Right, right. And uh, this was sort of one of the one of the deep little secrets of my success. I've been known as a designer for many years, but I also have an actual appreciation that we have to be able to get these out to people, get it so they're interested enough to try it. And if it really works for them, then be able to amplify what they have come up with Mm -hmm. as either feedback or in some cases, woohoo, appreciation. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and so one of your Dana disciples wanted to hear the story. Uh, <laughs> I won't tell you who it is. I mean, I'll tell you who it is. Roll, I, I read that on your uh, little <laughs> previous note thing, and my eyes rolled up into my head and looked at my brain and went, oh my God, this thing again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, has it been haunting you for years? <laughs> so apparently- oh, a few that have been haunting oh, I'm me sure there years. are. I'm sure there are. This one seems hey, a little- we, we have to agree that we have to leave one thing a tease. Do not ask me how Mystery Ranch got its name. Okay, okay that's not on my list. Thank yep, you Not on my much. list. <laughs> All right. Not on my list. Um, but, so so know, this in guy- In actuality, I have had a beard since- before I could grow a beard. Yeah, you though um, I, you've had a beard for a long time. Yeah, and apparently one oh, yeah. April one April Fool's Day you shaved it. Is that the story? Well, I mean, I, seriously, <laughs> I, we had gone to. All right, roll your eyes at this. We had gone to the mall. Okay, okay? Uh-huh. it was the uh, late eighties, and uh, I had my youngest daughter Claire with me, and uh, I gave her like six bucks to go to the arcade, and you know. Mm-hmm keep blowing quarters on the machines and um end up needing to get a haircut so <laughs> went into you know a mall hair dresser thing and got a haircut and i realized as i sat down in the chair it's april 1st <laughs> and wouldn't it be funny if i had them shave my entire beard off <laughs> and my kids had never ever seen me without a beard (laughs) and if i do say most so myself it wasn't huge i mean i kept it trimmed Mm -hmm. but it was magnificent a good beard right (laughs) oh man when i look at that picture it's like you were so young (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) Uh, and uh so you know, we didn't actually razor it down. Straight razors weren't really a thing anymore at the time, mm-hmm. but uh, it was as close as you could get with an electric razor. Wow. And yeah, I went out and hunted down my daughter and there she was. And I said, hey, Claire. <laughs> and she looked briefly around, paid me no attention. <laughs> And you know, talked away, and you know, oh, my dad's supposed to be getting here. Where is he? And I gave her another hey, oh, Claire, <laughs> and she looked at me, and the look of horror on her <laughs> face was just <laughs> priceless. It must have scared her. Having she's never seen you without oh, a did. beard. It Holy did. crap! Yeah, I can imagine. Oh, but and then I went home with her, <laughs> and I went in first, and my eldest daughter you know, took a look at me and her look of horror was she knew who I was, but it was just so wrong. Right, right. <laughs> um, and the screaming ensued. Oh, um, my God. My boys, they yeah, weren't sensitive. We're boys. It yeah, was right, whatever. Sort of, yeah, okay. What did you do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this this became... You know, I think uh, our, our Scientology friends would say an engram. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> nice. Ah, uh, yes, one of those things that you'll be having to exhaust it through six lifetimes. Right, right, uh, right. And then you walked into the office into a meeting or something. I did, and you know, it's just sort of, ooh, that's wrong. I mean, the universal uh, verdict was grow it back not good yeah right yeah yeah right, yeah. yeah did you and, immediately uh, grow it back then oh yeah i just yeah, let it grow good. back yeah, i mean yeah. and uh that was that and uh, i must say that uh even now it looks better than my naked chin 
<laughs> well, some of us can grow good ones and some of us can't. <laughs> yep. So uh, Mystery Ranch has been around now for 20 years. What was the inspiration for that brand? How'd that come about? Well. Obviously, you must have, you know, missed the uh, missed the game, so to speak. After Well, yeah, but I mean, I wasn't even good enough to miss the game for long. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty um, quick. Right? And, and but when I left Dana Design, um, you know, look at it this way. Uh, I left a business that had my name on it. Yeah. I was earning six figures. I was still the president for yeah, yeah. whatever that was worth. Yeah. And, uh, but things had really changed. We no longer controlled our own production yeah. in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, it was very difficult to face up to what the line was becoming, trying to simply chase the right look mm -hmm. as opposed to, Hey, this stuff has looked the way it's looked for years because this is what works. Yeah. And built the way it's um, built. Yeah. 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 We were supposed to be graduating. Yeah. Um, and, uh, my business partner, Renee, uh, two years after we had sold this thing to K2 and, uh, when they made us give up production that we controlled in the United States that we made good money with, mm -hmm, right. But hey, everybody's going offshore, kid. Yeah, I think that was the last time anyone ever called me kid. I was <laughs> in my late forties, uh, and you know, I value not being called kid anymore. I must say. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and we just, you know, we we had three plants in Montana, and I went around and shut down each one myself. Mm. These were my people. Yeah, wow. but uh, it was pretty traumatic. There was a fair amount of tears yeah, but. on both uh, groups of people's part. When we had to let everybody go, I was able to negotiate something that was not a regular open thing. It's called Trade Adjustment Assistance Program. Hmm. And uh, what it meant was through the help of uh, you know, our, one of our Montana senators at the time, we got put into a program that was designed for auto workers. Oh, interesting. And everybody who wanted to either train or go back to college had their educations paid for. Oh, cool. So the very great majority of people that made up Dana Design went on to do other things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This actually mattered a few years later, three years later, when I left – and, when I, and, and a couple of other old hoary stories, but uh, mm -hmm. quickly told and they're true. Um, after I resigned, I had no intentions of doing a pack company or even something in the outdoor industry. Mm, interesting. And we had money. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, there was a few million involved in selling out to demand. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, and we were looking at 1999. This was the height of Internet 1.0. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at, you know, oh, let's put together, you know, a, a, a subscription program. Websites weren't quite that big a deal back then. And, uh, you know, we were looking at uh, highlighting trails and doing uh, all sorts of information and it's going to be a content based website play. And then we'd build it up and then we'd sell it to some group of idiots because everything was getting sold then. And mm -hmm. yeah. you know, we were going to get this thing going and get a coder and, uh, fuck. Yeah. Uh, and during this run up in 1999 in the spring, um, you know, I still had some sewing machines and uh, eldest daughter, Alice, asked me for something that she claimed I hadn't really built during her lifetime, which was a simple hip sack. Hmm. We had built big, complex ones, yep. ones where you could put 10 kilos on your waist and have it carry reasonably comfortably and yep. be out of the way of your arms and all that. Um, but you needed you know, a few extra straps and you kind of had to operate it. Mm -hmm. Um, she wanted something simple hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, this had also been during a time. I mean, she was, 
19 at the time, but from 17 to 19, um, she was a nightmare. Okay. <laughs> all right. I was Aren't we all two. though? <laughs> oh yeah. She was something special. <laughs> Um, it's a, to the degree that none of my young, younger kids ever gave a peep of trouble because it wow. was like, so Oh she, no. So you had no, uh, works out. you had, you had no previous, uh, experience with this. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> but, uh, so I did like, you know, a weekend, three, four days worth of work. And it kind of felt cool to be doing something from scratch again, mm -hmm. as opposed to being locked in the corporate uh, uh, force field and yeah. everything flowing from ROI and uh, what are your projections and you can right. meet the quarter. Right. Right. Oh, God, it was horrible. Well, it's something you knew, too. I mean, you get your hands dirty and you're working with fabrics well, and Well, and I was making and... stuff up. Right, right, yeah, right. Yeah. With no thought to any commercial thing. Right. And I came up with what was, to me, an acceptable, good tech butt pack that worked with one strap. And mm -hmm. it did it through some little extra framing that kept everything wrapping around your body. And which is, in actual point of fact, part of every larger pack I still build. Mm -hmm. um, something you. we call lumbar wrap. Mm -hmm. And I handed it to her. And she put it on and it worked and it was one pull. And she turned around and looked at me and said, thanks, dad. That's just what I wanted with a big smile. Wow. It had been years since I had a smile like uh, that. That's cool. That's a great and, story. And uh, I literally felt something go in my chest. Yeah. And I can only refer to it as, oh, that, that's what it feels like when your heart breaks. And I knew, oh, crap, I'm a one-trick pony going back to this. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one-trick pony with a lot of different tricks, though. I mean, you've made a lot of great things over the years. So. Well, yeah, we have some really pretty darn good tricks. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, going from the birth of Mystery Ranch, which was entirely about getting back into the outdoor industry and working with specialty shops and mm -hmm. building stuff that would matter for them. And I came up with a very evolved set of ideas. Yeah. We designed some pretty cool stuff. Part of the whole gig was actually licensing a modular interface between the frame and the bag. Mm -hmm. And we licensed it to Kelty. So they built oh, cool. a series of packs that was, uh, sort of the uh, less expensive introductory version. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Good idea. And we had big, big ideas and the magazines loved it in 2000. And in the next two and a half, three years created a $3 million smoking hole in the ground. <laughs> Cause you know what? Packs aren't all that important to people. And the idea of getting into a modular system that will solve all of your pack problems for the rest of your life sounded great, but nobody was interested. Yeah, that mo <laughs> yeah that modularity <laughs> thing has never caught on, really. You know, no, a lot of no, different ways. it's one of those things yeah. where it's been tried you, a bunch you, of times. You end up hearing about it every two or three years, and yeah. you go, "Yeah, that's going to be interesting to watch." <laughs> yeah, been down that road. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. <laughs> We're going to take a little break and give some love to our episode sponsor, Creative Live. We'll be right back. Level up your creative game for free today with Creative Live and their amazing selection of live and on-air classes. With over 1,500 curated classes in photography and video, money and life, craft and maker, art and design, and music and audio, there is something for everyone. Watch their on-air broadcast for free or buy a class and own the content for life. Go to theoutdoorbizpodcast.com slash creative live and start building creative skills from the world's top experts today. Now back to the show. Well, over the years, though, you guys have created some really cool products out of Mystery Ranch. And one of the common themes in all your brands seems to be durability and functionality. You know, I it love absolutely is. I love that. I think that's huge. And my question, though, is where, where do you get your ideas? Do, they just, do you just go try stuff or do you see stuff that inspires we try a thought? Stuff, we see stuff. We see technologies that yeah. might be taking form mm. in other industries like aerospace or footwear, 
or the medical uh, spaces and go, yeah, I wonder if I could talk them into letting me use some of that. Mm. And uh, it's a process that we technically refer to as stealing. Uh, yeah, rip off and duplicate, R&D. <laughs> well, not rip off or duplicate. I mean, let me tell you, uh, when you're dealing with people who are doing materials for the shoe industry, mm-hmm. their mm-hmm. eyes light up <laughs> when they realize you're not a shoe dog and you're not about to try and pound them into a pulp to get the last 2% discount. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> uh, That's tough, and, yeah. You know, it basically, you know, yeah, we get influenced by things, but quite frankly, and and welcome it when it happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been known to license ideas. I've also been known to take them further. And I've been known to, you know, pound competitors into the earth with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all fun. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. yeah exactly. um, and you're turning out something that reduces pain i build packs i mean i built tents sleeping bags clothing etc mm-hmm. i focus down on the packs because a uh, a very limited human being and b <laughs> we could reduce pain the most yeah i mean i could have taken a hack at doing boots which is the only other thing that can hurt you that bad mm-hmm. but Man, boots are hard. Boots are tough. Yeah, <laughs> boots are tough. Everybody's feet are it's feet are unique. <laughs> yeah, that's yep. the other common theme is your pat your all your products carry very, very well. So yeah. It's uh it's something that is measurable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things we look at is not how to make something that feels like a puff of nothing on your back in the shop, but how is it gonna feel at the end of a long day yeah mm-hmm. with a and, full load uh, yeah a lot of the puff of nothing stuff if you keep the load down if you keep the load down to 18 pounds or so it doesn't matter that it's just hanging off your shoulders right once you get up to 25 pounds or so <clears throat> you are putting some substantial energy into carrying this yeah mm-hmm. and it is not the way your back would like to be dealing with it. So you've got to bypass that in some way. Right. And then if you were concentrating that load in some part of your hips or waist or on a part of your shoulders, they end up hurting too. Mm -hmm. We've Mm -hmm. discovered, even though with Clutterworks, I had stuff that for the time was ultralight. Well, it was built of materials that could resist a fair amount of rock and corn, snow, and other stuff. So Mm -hmm. it was semi-light, but Mm -hmm. we didn't have Dyneema back then. Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Uh, You know, we we ended up adding framing to transfer that load to the best areas on your back and to do it in a way that mirrored the shape of your back. Yeah, that's the beauty of what you did. with the Dana design stuff, well, you know, the major part of the load or the line had five sizes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, more or less, two for women, three for men. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, that was... uh, You know, it made it hard to fit. Well, yeah, it made it... it made it. Uh, you just had to spend some time getting the fit. That's what made the pack so great. I think you know it was it was hard to fit. You had to go through a lot of, you know, exercises to get it to fit right. But once you did, man, it was it was beautiful. Yeah, you know, if you fit it right and if it's used right mm-hmm. to use a pack properly, especially any internal frame out of the eighties, nineties, even up through roughly four or five years ago, you had to put the pack on. Loosen up the waist stabilizer straps, loosen up the lifters, pull the belt tight, pull the shoulder harness tight Mm -hmm. if it's remotely well fitted. Yeah. And then tension the hip belt stabilizers and the lifters. And if you didn't do that, you'd end up with the belt being pulled away from the rear corners of your back. Right. And you'd have areas that you could stick a fist down into. 
between the belt and your hips. Yeah, yeah. And the pack would simply end up sliding down your butt, hanging off your shoulders, and eh, not yeah, it wouldn't so good. function. Wouldn't function. Yeah, and I think the other thing you mentioned too is to get the right pack for the right job, right? I mean, there's a bunch of different packs that too. Yeah, that you and guys... that was one of the things. The Dana packs were. Yeah, okay, seven, eight pounds for the big ones, a mm-hmm. little heavy. Mm-hmm. But, man, they would transfer the load beautifully. Yeah, you, you, yeah, you had 45 pounds 45 of gear to that. 45 pound load. Exactly, carry fine. Of which they would be, you know, roughly 10%. Uh, they could, well, it might be okay, 15%, but yeah, yeah. Uh, they would make that load disappear from your consciousness. Yeah, exactly. You simply yeah. weren't aware of it. That's success. That's huge success, yeah. And I think that was is what really drove the success of the brand was, you know, the right oh, pack the for the right job. That's the only way we got away with it, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, sustainability. What are you guys working on sustainability-wise these days? Well, oh, man. A lot of things, it's I'm sure. It's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we've been trying to work with sustainability since the late Dana days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, back then, we were coping with trying to get recycled materials. Mm-hmm. The problem was no one was closing the loop right. on recycled materials. Um, and we ended up with the first generation of recycled polyesters being... 75% of the strength of virgin materials wow. mm-hmm. and 25% more expensive than virgin materials. So it was more expensive. It broke really fast. Yeah. Um, that segued into biodegradable materials <laughs> in the uh, early to uh, mid aughts. Right. And biodegradable materials were... Sixty-five percent of the actual strength of good, well-done materials that were not biodegradable, mm-hmm. and uh, they were more expensive, and the stuff broke a ton. But it would turn into uh, not quite compostable crap yeah, rot right. in a year. Mm-hmm. Well, that's wonderful. And, you know, as a manufacturer, I'm going, oh, cool. These things will last two years, maybe three, (laughs) and then it will be destroyed. And wait, uh, you know, I've I've heard of this before. And, uh, you know, it's just a a crappy way to get people to buy more stuff. Yeah, right. Um, This ties into something that actually happened from the Clutterworks days on. Hmm. Um, When I first started Dana Design, and uh, we were really starting to cook, it was, uh, you know, it started in August of 85, around 86, 87. I'm trying to sell packs to people, and they still have my old Clutterworks packs. Oh, wow, right. They're still operating. Yeah. And we're going, what's the actual lifetime and we found that at the time something that was being used say someone who lived in the la area we actually ended up finding there's roughly a 15 year lifetime Mm. and then the uh, nitrous uh, oxides (laughs) noxs uh, in the air from the air pollution mm. would be rotting the zipper tape. Oh, interesting. At about that time. And then, you know, you'd be working the zipper and the fabric next to the coil would just it's sort of up. rupture interesting. and blow out. Yeah. Um, but this, this actually had geographic focus. And that's when we started becoming aware of the uh, nitrides in the air yeah. being a bad thing. And, by the way, L.A. doesn't have that in the air much anymore. Well, yeah, I was going to say, when I was a kid, you could cut the air with a knife. Now it's pretty clean. And it's interesting, up oh, here, yeah. there's a ton of Dana packs up in Bishop. You know, the air's clean, There's and but there's a ton of folks that still use terraplanes and astroplanes oh, yeah. and bomb packs. Well, and this forever. actually slides around to 
at first we were worried <clears throat> because people wouldn't get new packs. But we found, you know what? Even if they loved it, at 15 years or so, yeah, they're probably ready to tack a new pack. Yeah, and right, we decided right. that kind of cycle was okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because we'd be reaching out to more and more people. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we've always had built the Dana stuff as durably as we could. And yeah. that meant delving into the material science right down to what polymers are being used right. and how. Mm-hmm. And what is something, what is paying five cents less for a piece of hardware worth? versus having something that will last close to forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was not driving us from a sustainability perspective at the time. That was just simply, we actually fix these things. We don't buy three or five or 10% extra figuring that, oh, well, and then there's the warranty stuff and we'll just give them a new one and they'll go away. Right. Um, We will give you a new one if we've truly effed up yeah if you truly destroyed it yeah yeah but uh we are much more likely to fix it Mm -hmm. and learn from it Mm -hmm. and incorporate that into how we go forward Mm -hmm. and the fact that i started out repairing and modding gear not just bringing forth strokes of genius from my forehead (laughs) uh affected a lot of how we actually operate to this day yeah um, we fix things. Um, oh, and a little aside, I had Clutterworks sold out of it. Uh, it actually went bankrupt twice in the next five years. Wow. Uh, guess I made a good move there. Yeah. Had Mojo, my camera bag thing. Um, did it for six years, exceeded pretty well. Um, single lens reflex cameras as something every single person carries kind of went away as Japanese perfected autofocus cameras Mm -hmm. and lots of camera bags weren't being used as much anymore. Mm -hmm. I started building packs with more frame and the, for the first two years, uh, you remember I mentioned those marmot packs and you twigged a little at it. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. That in 1985, the marmots, gave me a call. We were building all of them. It was entirely my design. Mm. We put a marmot label on it. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Um, And fully legitimate, great way to do things. Um, My camera bag partners didn't think the outdoor market would uh, be something that would uh, (laughs) flourish. Oh, by the way, their major thing was they sold darkroom chemicals. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a business that will go on forever. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> that's gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, entirely gone. Yeah. Wow, interesting. Um, yeah. And uh, that was when I essentially had a reset. Now, I could have continued producing the Marmot packs under my Mojo label, mm. um, but we ended up coming to a parting of the ways with yes my partners in the photographic industries they went and started building tiny little pockets in costa rica Mm -hmm. and it sort of faded away Mm -hmm. whereas i was building early computer cases uh stuff for carrying video gear gotcha but we had this pack design we built it in two sizes for men and for women and otherwise adjustably This was, by the way, started in 1983. We took it over as our own thing in 85, Mm -hmm. um, which is a while back for doing women's stuff. Yeah, exactly. Renee is about five foot one inch tall, and she'll punch me right in the kneecap if we don't build for women. (laughs) Uh, Good for her. (laughs) Yes. Um, So we then did Dana Design uh, starting in 85. and. Who, uh, selling the company in 95 and me leaving the company in 99. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing is, everything I'd ever built in those previous companies became orphans. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So at Mystery Ranch, we fix anything I have ever built. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. And keep it going simply because those other gone have stopped. Yeah. Um, so and, that's uh, a couple of your sustainability initiatives then, or you continue to pr- fix and repair stuff that you initially built. And then the other absolutely. thing is that the longevity is a sustainability story too, because you only had to buy, you know, one pack would last you a lifetime as opposed to That buying. only works if you love the pack. Well, true. Right. True. Yeah. If it carries, and, well, if you uh, buy a good pack initially too. Yeah. Right. Well, and that's the thing that we started noticing at mid to late Dana design was that by the time Dana design came around, when we sold it in 95, Mm -hmm. I'd been building stuff for 20 years already. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) And we were noticing that the most successful stuff was successful, not because it had a technological tick list, but because people Loved it and kept exactly. using it. Yeah, functional, carried. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was great. Pack. And yeah. realizing that your best stuff, the bomb pack, yeah. the terraplane, yeah. the alpine, the gallatin hip sack, had that kind of user base. Well, it still does. Those products are still in use here in the Eastern Sierra today and probably all around, you know, mountain towns. You know, you can still see people out and with a bomb pack. I am so proud of that. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, yeah me to too. Tell you. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, the thing that was the big difference for mystery ranch, we're still built it extremely durable, Mm -hmm. but we built it. So you didn't have to use it remotely well, and it didn't even have as tweaky a time, uh, being fitted. Mm -hmm. We came up with a really, really good system where changing the length of the pack also changed the shape of the pack Mm -hmm. to the shape of your back and that it automatically adjusts to you every time you put it on. Mm -hmm. And we built it so that it worked the way people actually use the gear. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Back when I mentioned, Oh, you know, you loosen up all these straps and then pull (laughs) these others tight and then you tighten the other straps. Nobody does that for real. They throw very few. Yeah. They throw on their shoulders and go. Exactly. And they don't get the performance they could get. Yeah, yeah. They get something that's good enough. They get something they like. Yeah. But they could get better. Yeah, that's And right. building these packs so they did their function well and basically sucked onto your back uh, with just simply pulling the straps that you're going to pull anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And none yeah. of that other bull. Well, that's good. Um, that's a good move. Yeah. Well, I mean, in retrospect, it's, well, duh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It took us 20 years but, to figure that out, but that's oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but along the way, I mean, you know, like Martin Hardware did a pack line that mm-hmm. had pulleys yeah. and, you know, all sorts of crazy the things. The exoskeleton thing. Remember oh, that Oh, yeah. Thing? You're yeah. supposed to yeah. adjust it yeah. differently for when you went uphill versus downhill. Right. It's insane. Yeah. And they took it as features at the time and it was no nobody's going to do that <laughs> but hey founders are a menace designers are a menace that's true. oh my god that's i'm true. both <laughs> <laughs> that's true let's uh let's shift gears again a little bit now we're so we're both sitting here during this covid-19 pandemic in our uh stay at home the current unpleasantness yes yeah it's crazy yeah but you guys are building uh protective equipment right for medical personnel we absolutely are that's very cool and uh we did not you know here is how we will do our there was a simple crying need at the local hospital Mm -hmm. for masks Mm -hmm. and i had a couple of ideas uh there were local people called the gallatin quilters guild where they were taking all of their hoarded cotton for doing decorative quilts and things and they wanted to make masks and uh we came up you know we we were asked well we heard about it and we talked to him and as it turns out we have bind seam binding we have uh webbing we Mm -hmm. have elastic we have cord locks so we started kicking that stuff in cool but these people were essentially with a few 
intermediate leaders in, in the fabulous American tradition of people come together, see a problem, yep. solve a problem, yep. which is freaking awesome. That's awesome. Good for you guys. But yeah. we had skills. Yeah. And so we ended up taking over, revising, and redesigning uh, the masks a bit. And our basic hospital mask is still a version of a pleated uh, surgical mask, mm -hmm, but it mm -hmm. fits better. Cool. Uh, our key thing is coming up with better materials. Right. And we had a material we had been looking at for facing body panels and hip belts and such mm -hmm. that was essentially a shoe lining material, hmm. but absolutely breathable. As it gets loaded up with the humidity from your breath, it still feels dry hmm. and it has a germicide built in. Oh, perfect. Guaranteed good for a hundred washings. Wow. Perfect. And that material felt an awesome amount better than a bit of cotton ticking with some lint coming off. It. Yeah, right. And cool. so as the, and by the way, this process has been going on for two and a half weeks. Wow. Good for you. Yeah. I mean, three weeks ago, there was nothing. We were mm -hmm. fat, dumb, and happy going, oh, they're going to close, close doors. What? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, All of us. Yeah. So we have been cutting material, sending it out into the community, working with the volunteers. We have now started building stuff because as awesome as volunteers are, <laughs> A large proportion, once they've done their first 50 or 70 or 100 masks, yeah. will fall away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? It isn't that much fun to sit down at a sewing machine and do the same thing 40, 50 times in a week. Right. Much less, if you were going to get to true throughput, you have to be doing 50 to 70 a day. Right, right. Or more. And yeah, that's, we're yeah. paying our people to do it, and it's the job. And we, unlike, quite frankly, most people in the outdoor world, have our own production space. Right. Because we build things not just to be built in Asia and sold in stores uh, or on websites. Half of what we do, we are building for the U.S. or Canadian or other militaries. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. right. Or we are building for outfitting wildland firefighters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons our stuff isn't built to be measured in grams. It's in ounces and pounds. Yeah. Well, it's built it's to function, just, you know, functionality. And it's carrying heavy stuff. It is stuff. the functionality. Yeah, exactly. And if something breaks in the field, your hose. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, even the, even from that perspective, we also design our stuff. So if it does break in the field, you have a way to fix it and keep going Yeah, and because it's utterly necessary. You can't stop. This is yeah. the side of the business we call the mission side of the mm, business. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And we are building stuff for people that don't have a choice about using it. We are building stuff for people that uh, back in the 90s at Dana Design, we noticed that when we were dealing with some of the very best climbers and skiers in the world, mm -hmm. ego wasn't really a part of it. They just did this stuff. Yeah. It's when you start dealing with the spread of more people, you get into some people who are playing ego games. And we discovered that in the tier... One, the, the, the really highly skilled areas of the military. Okay. The SEALs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Army Special Forces, mm -hmm. um, Air Force, uh, PJs, combat controllers. These folk were focused on what they were doing. They had awesome skills and they were about doing it. Yeah. Not unique individuals. Yeah bathing in it right right not telling anybody and, about it just uh, had to be done so we went and did it yeah 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 and we discovered that those two the only group of people that compared to some of the best hardcore outdoor people in the world were hardcore military mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and sense, it allowed yeah. us to forge 
kind of a bond. Mm -hmm. And we did some stuff for them back in the 80s and 90s that we simply did it. We didn't do a lot of publicity about it. And we earned some trust. Yeah. Well, you're still doing it today. And uh, And, we all appreciate uh, that. We've earned a lot of trust. And we also get to solve fascinating yeah. problems. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. But it is a different part of the ranch, but it also means we have our own 50 person so plant and we run lots of other contractors based on the skills we keep alive mm, at right. that sewing plant. Gotcha. Uh-huh. And uh, it's different than how you do things to get a great job done in Asia. Yeah, we yeah. are an ISO 9001 certified company. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've put the systems in place to do these things. And being able to have a good and controlled system where people are still able to have some fun mm-hmm. is all part of how we run the business. Now, I wish I could tell you we had a highfalutin statement of purpose. Well, we do kind of, but the actual standard we run the business to is let's not suck. <laughs> that's and a you good, know what? That's a good statement that's of purpose. Actually, that's pretty hard to do and be a sizable and substantial business yeah. with a hundred internal employees yeah, total. Yeah, yeah. And be one of the larger pack makers uh on earth, yeah. which we in fact are. Yeah. You guys are still doing great things. Um, do you have any suggestions? Let me get back to, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Let me get back to the masks, okay. which as I say is the last two and a half weeks. Yeah. We are able to produce now a couple of thousand masks a week. Great. The volunteers have been, they have done, you know, getting up to a thousand yeah, and yeah. that's cool stuff, and we're still supporting them. But we are being pulled into building masks. Mm-hmm. We're doing the stuff for the hospital. Mm-hmm. We're trying to define what a steady state is. Mm-hmm. But one of the other things that has to be realized is once the supply chain of disposables, of N95s, of surgical right. masks, et cetera, right. has filled up big enough to actually supply the need what we are doing for hospitals the need for that goes away Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like chopped off and that will happen and it'll be a good thing yeah um that being said there is a true need for masks for people out in the world what we call street masks oh exactly yeah around the around the world we are working building that right now oh great they are not going to be as restrictive as something that is keeping you sealed away from stuff down to 2.5 microns Mm -hmm. like n95s because you know what they're really hard to breathe through yeah they are and we need stuff that isn't going to make you want to tear it off your face if you're wearing it all day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is why we are dealing on the material development side of things, and we are going to places and people that aren't the immediate obvious first choice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's some very interesting stuff coming out. Um, What we've done for masks so far is known because of a couple of Instagram postings, Mm -hmm. and there's going to be more. Good, good. Well, I look forward to looking, seeing it, and hopefully we don't. This doesn't continue too long, and we can get True. back to normal. Yeah. Um, as we go to wrap up here, do you have any suggestions or advice for someone wanting to get into the outdoor biz or grow um, their career? Maybe if they're already in the biz. First off, work in a retail store. Yeah, great advice. Yeah, yeah. Flat out. Yeah. You need to not just get into what you would like, but to see what other people are after and how it is to in fact interact with them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's really kind of necessary to learn what makes the frog jump. <laughs> that's right. That's right. No, that's good advice. That's a lot of folks have said that. And I firmly believe that that's what, uh, it's just, you learn so many things at retail that you don't learn anywhere else along the way. So that's oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah. And you encounter lots and lots of people for good or for ill. And 
you know, everybody who's worked retail will have a story about that one person <laughs> who broke them. Yeah, right. That's right. We all have that. That's right. Yeah. Um, and it ain't pretty. That's right. As we finish up, is there anything else you'd like to ask or say to our listeners? I have to tell you, the stuff I have been able to do, the people I have been able to build gear for mm. and to build gear with, um, it's, it's what an incredible, charmed life. And uh, it's something I'm thankful for. It's something I have to continue working to be worthy of. And uh, it beats honest labor. <laughs> yeah, I would support that 100%. Well, it's been great catching up, and I will uh, look forward to seeing you at the next show or maybe in Montana would be better. That would be a better place to meet. That's uh, not bad, although somewhat closed for business right now. Oh, yeah, same as Bishop. Don't, yep, we, we don't want anybody coming up here. Stay at home. Follow. We'll, we'll get through this a lot quicker if we all stay at home. So, Yep. Well, thanks, Dan. It's been great catching up. Thanks, Rick. It's been a ton of fun. All right, take it easy. Thank you for listening. If you want more of the Outdoor Biz Podcast, be sure and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast. Be sure and go to theoutdoorbizpodcast.com where you find all the episodes, show notes, and much, much more. Have a great week and be sure to get outside. <laughs>